Well, good morning. It is really, really good to be with you folks. Um, it's also really good personally because I've been on the road since October, around the world a couple times in that, home a couple times. The last time I was home, I was home one night, back on the road. This is my last thing. I will be home Tuesday. I'm staying home till the middle of August. No more travels. If there is a travel planned, I'm losing the ticket. So we're excited, but we're real excited to be with you folks. What a wonderful way to finish off all these travels. What I'd like to do today is a little different. It's going to be different, the whole aspect. No PowerPoint, no pictures, no three-point sermon, no phones. <laughs> um, I just would love us to take some time today to celebrate our God. Celebrate his purpose, celebrate his agenda, celebrate what he's doing, and celebrate that he is victorious, and as a result, we are too. What I love to do, I'm not, my goal isn't to challenge you or to teach you. My goal is to just lift our eyes into the harvest, lift our eyes into what is God doing and what do we get to be a part of. What I want to show you first here is a short video. It's about five minutes, but it's a celebration of his work and what we together have been a part of. I know you guys, even this year, have sent teams out. You've sent pa your pastors out. By the way, I want to encourage that. Most churches want to keep their pastors closed for their own programs and agendas. And to think of their pastor or pastors leaving, going on trips, is, kind of leaves a church uncertain. But a church that gets the heart of God is sending their people out as much as they can. Because that's what God does. But I would like to today just encourage you with the fruit of your labor. And encourage you with, you guys have given and given, and you have been a part of a church plant deep in the jungles of Indonesia, many other ministries I know, but focusing on one, where Kathy and I have served, where you have supported us, where you have prayed, you have loved on us. But God has done something amazing, and we get to see the fruit of our labor. And so we were just, again, you guys have helped us every year. We're back in Indonesia for about three months helping the field there. You guys have been the primary ones making that possible. But our last time there, we were back into the Moy tribe. We try to do that every two years, get back into Moy. And this time, we had the incredible privilege of being there while the Bible arrived for the first time. My brother-in-law, my sister, have been continuing to serve there. They have finished the New Testament. They have finished 1,500 verses of the Old Testament, which is enough for the foundations for the New in the meantime, they'll continue working on the Old Testament or at bits and pieces as they can. But the Bible showed up for the first time amongst the Moy people. And I don't know what, that, what you, have you ever thought of that? What would that feel like to see God's Word showing up for the very first time where you can actually see it and hold it in your language for the first time? Now, just to think back, it was 24 years ago that Steve and I jumped out of the helicopter for the very first time amongst the people that had never been contacted. They had never seen cloth. They had never seen a white person. They didn't know there was even white people in the world. They didn't know there was such a thing as straight hair, believe it or not. All they had ever known was curly hair and black skin and no clothing. Um, that's quite a change to have clothed, white, straight-haired people. Some of, I even had hair then. Um, what got, I remember that first day thinking, Lord, how in the world are you going to do this? This is too much. How are you going to plant a church amongst the people that we didn't know a single word? Of, no one in the world knew a single word of their language. We had to start one phrase, one word, one concept at a time. And here we are 24 years later with a church that has the word of God in their language. They've actually, there's actually one of their people, our members of Ethnos now. They've joined our mission. They've been through it. We have three that have gone through our training. One is now already being sent out to another people group. Like, that's God working. So let's just, I, it's a fight. Just, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but this is what we just experienced in January. I came back in February. I'm not a video maker, but our guys in the office said, hey, Tim, can we interview you? They asked me some questions I shared, and then I just gave them my phone. I, I don't even know how to get all the pictures off my phone. So I gave them my phone. They pulled pictures, and this is what they put together in about a, two days. So this just shares what we get to be a part of together. We need sacrificial goers to reach this world as one team together, all in, all committed. It doesn't start with a Bible being handed out. 
It was actually 26 years ago, in 1998, a pilot came to our house and said he saw a people group in the jungle. He was pretty sure there was houses there, but there was no record of that. So we spent the next year and a half making plans. In 2000, we made first contact with these people that had never seen the outside world. They didn't know there was clothing and white people and so forth and so on. I mean, at least most of them had never seen or heard of that. Spent four years learning their language, another year preparing to teach, putting some of God's word into writing, preparing lessons, literacy, teaching them to read and write their Bible as it's being translated. Started teaching in 2005. First time went through with a small group. By 2006, a large group wanted to hear, and the, the church has been growing and developing ever since. Just this year, in January 4th of this year, it's kind of like a climax when the word of God can be handed out in the people's language in their own hands, their version, it's the full New Testament over 1,500 verses of the Old Testament, which is enough to give the foundation for the New Testament. And of course, we love to see more translated over time from the Old Testament. To see the joy in the people, I like to see they now have God's Word in their hand, a full version that they can read and share and teach and teach their own children the heart of God. And they love to say, God is putting his speech on this leaf, and we get to read it. We get to hear him talk to us. It's really hard to describe just what it feels like when you see people getting God's word. But the process, when you're deep in the jungle, one plane comes in with some people, another plane comes with some Bibles, another plane with some Bibles and more people, and it's mounting. But the very first time, even the first plane came in with the first load of Bibles, the people weren't sure what to expect. How would they feel when they would see God's word for them? How do you prepare for that? But I, if I could just give you a brief idea of, of the sense um, praying desperately the night before that the weather would be good, that the planes could come in, we wouldn't be rained out. God, we need you to control even the weather for your word to arrive to these people tomorrow. So the crowds were gathering. Many people were more than you'd ever see at the airstrip. People were in the village just below. And as the plane was circling, it had to circle a couple times because there's clouds in the way right at the foot of the runway. We're all thinking, oh no, not this. God cleared the clouds out of the way. The plane came in, it landed. It was pretty quiet, more quiet than normal, because everybody's not sure. What will this be like? How will it feel? As the plane turned around, the pilot opened the door, people started to move forward, but different than normal. Everybody's just not sure. What's this gonna be like? The pilot ran around the back and he opened the door, we could see all these boxes of Bibles. And all of a sudden, a group of ladies, and then some men moved towards the airplane and started dancing around the airplane. They were dancing, and, and, and you could see people coming, and the, the word is out, and people are running up from the village, and the, the crowd was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's just this mass of people dancing and singing, and, and some with, with children on their back, some with moy dress of very little, some with very modern clothing, some with hats, but all with an excitement that they have God's word, and the dancing and the singing is kept going around the airplane, around the airplane. I was watching all the activity, and then all of a sudden, I noticed as I looked at Stephen Carolyn, who my sister and her husband who have been working for 20 years to translate God's word into their language, to see them standing there off to the side just crying. Thousands and thousands of hours of work, translating, studying, is this accurate? Do I have the heart of God in these verses? To see them standing there just bawling. And then to see their daughters came up. And the daughters for years have shared their parents in a sense with the ministry and the Moy people and they've lived in the jungle and the daughters, their faces were just flowing water. And it struck me, this is huge. God's word. And it wasn't easy, it was a lot of work. And it wasn't just them, it's their churches and their faithful friends and family who've been supporting them all the pouring their money and sacrificing. Pilots of airplanes, innumerable flights in and out, bringing food and supplies and visitors, furloughs, Guest housekeepers, finance people have been in an office with no way, they'll never meet them away in the side of eternity, working to support them. All that, it just struck me, wow, what a big deal. God's word, it's not a small thing, it's huge. It's not a big tribe, maybe two to 5,000 people, but it's God's heart that every time tribe and nation will stand around the throne. And here's another one that had God's word in their hand. It's so worth it. There's opportunities to give, opportunities to give your life 
to volunteer to get a sense. We have our own training. We'll prepare you. We're excited to prepare people the best we can. It's laid out in our website. Please, take some time. Just start there. Do a little adventure through the online website and see what God could use you to be a part of bringing his word, his gospel, his church to all peoples of this world. Isn't that fun? That's us. We get to be a part of that. What I'd like to do today is take a little time to think about two different fathers in Scripture, two stories in a sense, but I would like to do a bit more than just that. I'd like to help you see where this story of two fathers ties into a much bigger story, and in the theological terms, we call it the meta-narrative of Scripture. Anybody familiar with that term? The big picture of the Bible? And that's what I'm going to do. And this is Genesis over here by that railing. And that's Revelations over there by that railing. So we're going to walk through Scripture today. And we're going to see what the meta narrative of, of Scripture, meta narrative of Scripture is. What is God doing? And how does it all, how do we fit into the big picture of what God is doing? Is that okay? Can we do that? So, probably not normal, but I'm going to start over there. Can you, if you can turn your heads a little bit. So this is quite a few thousand years ago. None of us remember that. None of us were there. In fact, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and your many, many, many grandparents back weren't there. But if we go all the way back to the very beginning, we all know the verse in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning. That's the start of it all. Genesis means in the beginning, the beginning. But if we go back to Genesis, we don't know what happened, except we know very well what happened because God gave us, gave us a clear account in his word. And if we go back to Genesis and we start right here, we know that God, we, we're familiar with the story of creation. God created the world in six days, right? And he rested on the seventh. And on day six, he created Adam and Eve, created... There's so much of the teaching, I wish you could hear from the way the Moi would teach. The Moi talk about Adam being created and the way they describe it, because they're familiar with the jungle and dirt and the farmers, and the way they describe it is they say, and so God, God got a whole bunch of dirt and he put it all together, and that dirt was so dead, which is accurate, dirt is dead. But then they just go on to say, but God took that dirt that he had taken and he put together and he breathed into the dirt which is what Scripture says, but we don't quite talk about it with that emphasis. And He breathed into the dirt, and the dirt came alive, and it was a human, it was Adam. But Adam didn't have a, didn't have a partner, and so God created a wife. And so it's Adam and Eve together in the beginning, and we all know God said, you know, you can eat of all of this. There's a smorgasbord, all this food, you can have it all. But there's one tree I don't want you to eat of, because that tree will cause you to die. But everything else, just don't touch it, but everything else is yours. Like, it's not like there was just a few choices. There was all kinds, but there's just one. Don't eat that one. But we all know that they ate of that tree, right? And that created the sin problem in the human race. We've never, get, we've never lost that. So that's back here. God kicks them out of the garden. You know the story of Adam and, or Cain and Abel and sin. So therefore, Cain kills Abel. It's, it's a carryout of what's in all of our hearts. But if you zip ahead after that creation story, we get up here about actually a little over a thousand years later, we have the story of Noah, and we all know the story of Noah and the flood. Who doesn't learn that in, in Sunday school? And we're quite familiar with the story of Noah. But if you're back here at the very beginning, do you know what God said to Adam and Eve when the, as soon as he created them? The first words, the very, very first words out of God's mouth to Adam and Eve and to mankind, which is ironic. The first thing he ever said, it's, it's not what you would expect. Back here, the first thing he said to Adam and Eve, he says, I want you to be fruitful, I want you to multiply, and I want you to fill the earth. That's his first statement to mankind. I want you to fill this earth with many people. So you get to Noah, and Noah's here, and, and the world has become so wicked. In, less, in just over a thousand years, or a thousand and a half years or so, man has become so wicked that it says it broke God's heart, even created man. But he saw one man who found grace in the sight of God, and that was Noah. And so God talks to Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. And he gives him the very clear directions how to do it. And, and we know the story. Adam and his family and a whole bunch of animals, two of every type, that God brought to the ark are loaded in the ark. The water comes down. The ark goes up on the top of the water. And all those people 
some scientists would say there could be, there could have been billions, of, the ages and how they were multiplied, there could have been billions of people on the earth by that time. There's a lot of people. That we know. They all die, except for eight. And after the, the, the floods come down, the family gets out of the ark. And you know, the first thing Noah does is he builds an altar to God and gratitude and thankfulness to God for what he's done. And God gives the rainbow, right? That's God's intention of the rainbow is this beautiful promise. Yes, man has sinned, but God has made a promise no matter what. I'll never flood the world like this again. But as Noah is standing in front of this altar just after they get out of the ark, God said something to Noah very interesting two different times in a short little period. While he's in front of the altar, God says, Noah, now we're starting over. Noah, I want you to be fruitful, and I want you to multiply, and I want you to fill the earth. That's always been God's heart, and even here it's reminded again. I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. What is the very next story in the Bible? We have the genealogy. Then by chapter 11 of Genesis, barely a step over. The very next story is a story of Babel. Babel's always fascinated me. What a name to begin with. Just a funny name. The story of Babel, and we got this, the, the people, they're, they're starting to grow, and they're multiplying. And remember God said, multiply, but fill the earth. What was Babel for? It tells us that they built this tower. I learned in Sunday school they're building this tower so they could get up to heaven and be like God. That's not what they said. They said, let's build this, this tower lest we be scattered. God said, I want you to scatter. So man's agenda, let's stay close. Let's build a tower so we don't scatter. Let's build a tower lest we be scattered. So God comes down. What does God do? He stops them. He doesn't wipe them out. He doesn't kill them all. He, doesn't, he just gives them a whole bunch of languages. Do you guys know how many languages in the world today? Like distinct different languages? There's about 7,400 languages today. There probably was a lot more. Some have gone extinct. I remember when we first got to Papua, the last people of two different languages died. So through the years, languages are, are going extinct. They're dying. But there's still about 7,400 in the world today. When God confused their languages and made a whole bunch of languages, he did an awesome job of it. Try learning a couple. Different stages of my life, I've spoken six languages. I can easily come out with three right now. But the other three are a little harder. I need some reminder to get them back out of the cobwebs. He created those languages. It actually tells us that he scattered them around the world. And we can argue, you can fight. In fact, go ahead without me if you want to argue about it. But the evidence, there's quite a few verses. It seems God literally scattered people all around the world. And he gave them what they needed to survive in each context. He gave them the insights and the knowledge and the understanding to live in places that will blow your mind. So right here, God seems to scatter people all around the world. That was always his agenda. They did, tried stopping. He says, nope. And, they gave him these, and every language he created, he created in such an amazing way that the full word of God can be fully and completely understood and taught and translated into that language. That's an amazing thing. It wasn't like he just, every language he intentionally designed to carry the story and the message of the gospel. So he creates all these languages. And you know, Noah was still probably alive when this man over here is born called Abraham. It, according to Jewish tradition, Abraham would go and spend the summers with Noah. We don't know that. But there's ancient writings about that. Um, but most likely, Abraham was about 12 years old when Noah died. Is it, you ever think about that? He could have heard stories from Noah. Could have. We don't know. But we know Abraham, born into, born into a godless society, people were rebelling, all kinds of that we know from history. Terrible things were already happening, and God calls out Abraham. Abraham, follow God. God told, leave your country, go to a land, I'll show you. He does that, and he's living there. But Abraham's getting older and older, and from the very first call in Abraham's life, God said, through your children, this whole world will be blessed. All families will be blessed. Well, the problem was he wasn't having children. And we know the story when he's about, I think it's around 90, Ishmael's born, and God said, no, that's not the one. You didn't do that the way I said. But when he's about, a, well, he is 100. His son, through his wife Sarah, is born Isaac. We know that story. Isaac starts to grow up. Hard to know exactly how old he is. Theologians say between ages about 12 and 20. That's quite a span, I know. But somewhere in that area, Isaac is growing up, 
And God talks to Abraham again and says, Abraham, I can see you love your son. But Abraham, I want you to take your son. And I want you to take him up on this specific mountain. And I want you to sacrifice him. Oh, <laughs> again, that's a shocking story to all of us. God, really? What were you thinking? Who would tell, if he's really a great God, why would he tell his son, or his child Abraham, his, his follower Abraham, now go take your son, your only son, this one that you love so much, and take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Does that make sense? You know, Abraham lived in a society that was full of sacrifice. In fact, every tribe that I know of in the remote jungles, they all sacrificed. There's something that God has put in mankind. He knows he has a need. Remember Adam and Eve sin? Every people group knows they have a problem with sin. Every tribe that I know of, and I know of many, they all have a system within their worldview of sacrifice, usually involving blood. Blood has to be shed. Something has to die for my salvation. That's, that's put into the heart of man. Abraham was familiar with the sacrificial system. We know they did sacrifices. It seems there's probably child sac people sacrifices, people in that era and that time. So when God says, Abraham, take your son, that wasn't a new concept to him. He takes his son up on the mountain, and as he's going there, he tells his servants, there's a whole message in itself, servants, you stay here with the donkey. Leave even the donkey behind and come up where I'm calling you. And he goes up on the mountain, and as they're hiking up there, Isaac says, Dad, you want to open up your word here in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Let's just look at this story. It's just like, wow, really? Isaac says in verse 7, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have fire, Isaac says. We have wood. But where is the sheep? For the burnt offering. I know we're going to do an offering to God, but we're missing something. We have wood, we have fire, but what are we going to sacrifice? I don't know exactly how old Isaac is. Let's guess he's 15, 18. The dad says, uh, God will provide a sacrifice. Verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they both walked on together. They get up on top of the mountain. They get to the location. And Abraham puts some stones together. He builds an altar. I'm sure Isaac is, okay, what's next? I don't know what takes place. It's not described. But somehow, whether Isaac willingly said, okay, or Abraham had to grab his son. I don't know. I'm, I can only guess. Somehow, Isaac is tied up and laid on that altar and we see Abraham with the knife in the air. He's ready to sacrifice his son. The whole story is mind-blowing. Like, who would sacrifice their son for any purpose? I wouldn't. I have two sons. I will die before you could ever get me near putting a knife in my own son's chest. But this father was willing to go through to that of obedience to God. We talk about missions, and that's a sacrifice. We don't know this kind of sacrifice. Abraham's knife is up, and God says, okay, stop. Well, the angel. There's a ram for you, Abraham. It's a perfect sacrifice. In fact, it's caught by its, its horn so that the body's not even scratched. Abraham gets over, and Isaac off the altar. That would have been an amazing moment of relief. They catch that ram, they put it on the altar, and they sacrifice it. God loved Abraham dearly. It was a test. At the same time, I'm like, God, I don't, still don't get that. I don't even want to try and explain it. And yet, God had a plan, and Isaac was spared. Amazing. What happens next, though, I think, is what's even more amazing, is God looks down on Isaac, Abraham and Isaac, and he says this. This is what the Lord says, speaking through the angel. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name. Now, when God swears by his own name, you know what's going to happen, and it is true. There's no question. It's not an if, maybe, or anything. It's a definite. I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. 
Your descendants will conquer the cities of all their enemies. Now listen, verse 18 of Genesis chapter 22. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That word nations, I want you to notice that. That is the word goi goi in the Hebrew. Goi goi means people groups. It means tribes. It means gatherings of people of one language. All the goi goi of this earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. And he says it again, all because you've obeyed me. You were willing to do that? All the goi goi will be blessed. God had a purpose from the beginning to the time of Noah to Babel. And right here to Abraham, he had a heart for the goi goi, all the people groups. This word goi goi shows up 559 times in the Old Testament. And we're going to quickly look at all of them. <laughs> no, we're not. There's no way. But if we were to zip ahead a little bit to the very middle of the Bible, the very middle, I'm right on that crack, dead center. That's Psalm 103 is the middle of the Bible. Step back a couple chapters to Psalm 46. There's a verse we all know. In fact, the church that my wife and I were sent from in Canada, they had the verse on the wall. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 46. Psalm 46, verse 10. We all know this verse. It's familiar to us. We love it. I love it. Psalm, 40, Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Amen? We know it. But what's next? The verse in our church in Canada has, be still and know that I am God, but that's all they put there. It wasn't until recently I'm reading it, I thought, wait, there's more to the verse. Why don't, why don't we put that part on the wall? The rest of the verse says this, I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. That has always been, there's 559 times, I'm going to grab two to look at. I will be honored amongst the goy goy is the word. There it is again. And then if you skip ahead again to Psalm 96, we're getting awfully close to the middle of the Bible, Psalm 96, verse 3. Psalm 96, verse 3. Publish his glorious deeds amongst the goi goi. What did we just see in Moy? What was that little short video? His deeds being published. When your pastors and your team, their team members, and you, you and folks as members go out into other parts of the world and you share what God is doing, you teach, what are you doing? You're publishing the amazing things amongst the goi goi that God has done. When you guys sacrifice and you give and you take your time to pray and you step out of your comfort zone and you encourage those that are going and those that are part, and when you step across the street and talk to your neighbor, what are you doing? You're publishing the amazing things God has done. You're making it known. The rest of the verse, tell everyone about the amazing things he does. If you skip down to verse 10, tell all the goi goi the Lord reigns. All the goi goi. Do you know there's still 1,200 goi goi, using the Hebrew word, that don't have a single verse in their language? 1,200 of those 7,400 languages don't have one verse, not one thought. In fact, they've never heard the name Jesus. There's many other numbers, but that's how many languages we know, specific, full, complete languages that have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's still about 1,200. Right now, in the middle of translating the Bible, as a mission, we're translating about 240 languages right now. We're in the middle of it. A bunch of others have been done. But altogether, throughout this world, there's about 1,600 languages in the middle of getting God's word. It's in process, but there's still 1,200 goi goi that's never been published yet. So we still have a job to do. We can keep working, keep giving of ourselves. <clears throat> Remember the father Abraham who didn't have to sacrifice his son? There's another father in Scripture. There's another father in Scripture that, it's our title, that he did spare. He did sacrifice his own son. Who? We all know, God the Father. This God the Father, the God, the King, the Creator, right back there at that first Genesis, that Creator had a plan when man failed and he promised a Redeemer someday. And it comes up all through the story because of time we haven't looked at all that. But there's a Father that said, you know, this world has a sin problem. The only answer is somebody who has never sinned to die for them. That's why only God could do it. No human is without sin. They're born with sin. 
The moment you're born, you're, you have sin in your heart. I remember when my son Brant was born, my oldest one. I'm new, I'm excited, I'm a brand new father. And I, my wife has just given birth to a perfect child, probably the first sinless child ever born in history. At least it felt that way. And you would not believe what happened. That baby Brant, turns out he had a temper problem. He was born and he liked the warmth and the cuddleness and the mom's voice. He loved the womb. But the moment he came out, he got beat red and just, rah, anger. I, I, the other two didn't do that. Brant had a temper problem. He was born with wrath. He was angry that we took him out of that womb. And he was just screaming. It wasn't like a cry. It was an angry cry. Like, Kathy, like, oh, wow. He's yours. He, like, he was angry. And the doctor made a comment. He's not happy about being out here, obviously. He was born with a sin problem. We all are. Not one of us could have died for mankind. Only God himself. So God the Father, who spared not his own son, that's from Romans chapter 8, verse 32. God the Father sent his son, who was the perfect lamb. How do we know he's the perfect lamb? Do you guys remember that word, goi, goi? That same word is translated ethnos in the Greek. The Latin Vulgate was there translating the Hebrew into the Greek Bible. Wherever it said 559 times goi goi, they translated that as ethnos or ethne sometimes. God sent his own son through a virgin Mary. Therefore, he had no sin, Jesus Christ. He's born as a baby, and you know when that baby was eight days old, if you turn to Luke chapter 2, you're going to see something amazing. If we had time, we would have gone through all those Old Testament passages, and so often it said that you will be a light to the goy goy. So often in the Old Testament. But here, in Luke chapter 2, verse 32, Jesus is brought into the temple. It's his eighth day. He's going to be circumcised. There's a man there who's been waiting, and this man, Simeon, holds up Jesus, and this is what he says. He is a light to reveal God to the, there it is, the English word nations. The Hebrew word was goi goi, but here it's ethnos. He's held up, a light to reveal God to the nations. He is a glory of your people, Israel. Jesus was sent to be a light to the goi goi, or the ethnos. Jesus lived 30 years growing up. Stubbed his toes probably, I don't know, I don't know if he... We know he has a perfect sacrifice. He must not have fallen or broken any bones. That was clearly taught in the Old Testament. The sacrifice had to be perfect. Jesus never broke his bones to be a perfect sacrifice. But he grew up a normal life, worked hard. We know he hungered. We know he ate. We know he drank. But when he's at 30 years old now, he's introduced to the world for the very first time. And as he's walking down, John the Baptist, who was sent to open the door and prepare the way for Jesus... John the Baptist has been baptizing. He looks up and he sees Jesus coming, and we sang the song earlier. I think it was the last song. How was Jesus introduced to this world as an adult? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You should have seen the moy when, the, when we presented that. They jumped up. Is he the Redeemer? Is he the promised Lamb? Is he going to take away our sins? Wait, get on the radio. Tell him to come visit us because he's perfect. We need him here. We had to tell him, just wait, keep listening. Behold the Lamb of God. The Moy were so excited. The Jews weren't sure what to think of it. The Lamb of God? You know, Jesus is baptized and as he's coming out of the water. What does the voice from heaven say? My beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Do you ever get confused. Maybe he didn't love his son that much. That's why he died for us? No, he wanted to know. In fact, later at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is there in the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his disciples and Elijah and Moses come down and guess what? Again, that voice from heaven, behold my son, whom I'm, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God wants us to know he loved his son dearly, but his son had to die for us. We know the story. He's crucified. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus said, Father, I know this is going to be hard. Could you take it away? I don't want to do this. The weight of the world's sin at once? No, please take it. I'm God. I can't take sin. Agonizing concept. He had to for you and I. 
if you truly loved us, to give us a way of salvation. To give us the good deeds to tell the world. We know Jesus says, but it's not my will, it's yours. He is crucified. He rises again three days later. What does he say? He actually said it three times before his crucifixion. No, once before, and immediately after, he says it, now go to Galilee, go to Galilee, go to Galilee. Why? He rose from the dead for a purpose. They all go to Galilee, and then Jesus looks at his disciples and says, now, I've done what I can. I'm going to let you do the rest. Take this news to the whole world. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Behold, all power has been given unto me. Right? Now go tell all the... Guess what word? Go tell all the nations. Or ethnos. Tell all the people groups what I've done. That's our, that's our marching orders. Go through the New Testament. 157 times the word ethnos. The people groups. God has a passion that all those people that were scattered back there that they all hear... That's where we fit in today. That's us now. Zipping ahead 2,000 years. I, was, I probably got that proportionally wrong. 2,000 years later, here we are. What do we do? You folks are sending people out. You're giving. You're sacrificing. You're working hard. Why? To live, to eat, to drink. But you're also giving. I know you're giving because I see the fruit of it. You're the only church in all of North, and I know a lot of churches, you're the only church that has given me the freedom to write you every year. We're heading off to Indonesia. Can you help us with our tickets? You're the only church. That's huge because you're sacrificial. Celebrate that. Praise the Lord that you're part of this fellowship. You look at life a little differently. I want to encourage you. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep sending your pastors. Keep sending your best. Keep sending yourselves. Keep going on these trips. Keep sharing. Keep praying. Stay engaged. I, had, I did preach at one church one time. I was about to get up at the very first message. It was a missions conference. I think I had four or five messages to give. But the pastor stood up. He looked at his church and says, Listen, I want you folks to listen well. And if the Lord lays on all of your hearts to go to the mission field, that would be awesome. In fact, if all of you leave and go to the mission field, we'll refill the church. I've only heard that once. That's actually a scary thought. But could even to that stage, you say, Lord, we're all in. If you want our pastors, whatever time they're gone, most churches don't want their pastors. They're on salary. Sorry, you're missionaries, by the way, and you're doing it. If the Lord wants your pastors gone, if he wants some of your key leaders gone, that's okay, because God will provide to reach this world as a cost. But you know, the story's not done if you go to the end of the Bible, you're all watching the clock. We're right on time here. We're not behind. You get to the last, chap last book, Revelations. Do you know what comes up twice there? We get a glimpse into heaven, two different scenes in heaven. But both of those scenes, scenes, it's Revelations 5, verse 9, and Revelation 7, verse 9. It tells us that around the throne, two different times, around the throne there's people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. What is that word, nation? That word is ethnos. That word ethnos is translated as Gentiles, Gentile, nation, sometimes peoples, sometimes world. Every tribe that was scattered way back there is going to be showing up in heaven around the throne. That has always been the meta narrative of Scripture that all the world would know. Publish his deeds. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how long before the Lord comes back. I suspect soon. I, I know it's soon, but what does that mean? I think it's like, truly soon. But in this time we have, you have nothing better to do than be all in in giving all these people groups an opportunity to hear. I want to encourage you with that. Now, I want to encourage you, too, that we're not there yet. We're still here. As you folks are praying, you wouldn't believe what God is doing. I want to share with you one story. We have a few minutes. One story of something that, is ha that has just happened, and this is as a result of your involvement. You have given, you have prayed, you have encouraged, you have cared about that Moi tribe. Remember the Moi tribe where we just saw they got the Bible? In November of last year, the Bible dedication was, was planned for January 4th, and it happened. But in November, something huge happened just a couple months before. So just, what would that be? November's, what are we, six months, eight months ago. This just happened. 
There was a young girl who grew up right around our house and our missionaries, and we knew her as a little girl. I, when my wife and I were there, she was really little. But as she was growing up, she, she just fell in love with this Jesus she was hearing about. In fact, it was her brother who heard us missionary speaking. He shared it and made it clearly with her. She got saved as a young girl. She grew up right close to my sister there after my wife and I were gone. And she just loved Jesus. And my, my sister and her husband are translating, so they had one book at a time. They didn't have the whole Bible yet, but one book at a time. And at, at one stage, she's about eight, eight, nine, ten, something like that years old. She came to my sister one night, and she said she had a little bag. They make their bags out of bark from the trees, and they're beautiful. They're woven. It looks like string. You'd think it's an awesome bag made by a machine. But no, it's made from bark, woven into string, woven into this great bag. And for a little girl, their most important possession is their, what they call the noken. That, that's their thing their mother makes for them. That's what all their worldly possessions fit into. And that is their thing, is their noken. She had her noken. She came to my sister and she said, you know, I'd like to trade my noken for a flashlight. Now, to us, they'd be like, what? That'd be like, I want to I wanna trade my Mercedes that I inherited from grandpa for a flashlight. My best thing. My sister said, why do you want to trade a flashlight or get a flashlight with your noken? She goes, huh. I just love reading God's Word, but it gets dark every single night, and I just, that's when I'm free, and I want to read, and I can't. It's too dark. I thought, if I can get a flashlight, I can keep reading God's Word. This is a young girl with a heart for Jesus. You have been a part of her life. Her name is Ese Tadi. You've been, you don't even know her. You'll meet her around the throne someday. Ese Tadi grew up. She was about a big girl now. She's probably 13, 14, and that's when they get married. And so her brother did a, what they call a sister swap. Her brother, who loved Jesus, traded for a sister from about three days' hike away for that man's sister. He took that sister and his sister, which is Ese Tadi, goes to him. Now, that's three days' hike away to the uh, Bummy Valley. And she was sent over to the Bummy Valley, and the man there that she was sent to, to be married to and to live with and become his wife, he was probably 30, 40 years old, older. He already had a few wives. By the way, Ese Tadi, his, her dad had six wives. She was the daughter of the fourth wife. That's common there. That's a, but six is unusually a lot. Terrible grammar, sorry. Forgive me. Unusually a lot. Six wives. Anyways, that creates lots of house issues, you can just imagine. They're just like us. So she grew up in that context. Well, she sent far away over to this man. He already had a couple wives. I think she would be the third wife. And he didn't know Jesus, didn't love Jesus, didn't care. And Ese Tadi was alone with nobody else around her who loved the Lord. It was really, really, really hard, she said. He was really, really, really mean to her. And he would beat on her. And he did not like Jesus and didn't want Ese Tadi praying. And he resented that. And it was only a couple years and he just hated her more and more. And Ese Tadi was doing her best to stay true to Jesus. And one day she said, I looked in his eyes and I knew he intended to kill me that day. I knew, and now these Moy people often killed their wives for many reasons, usually because of that they suspected sorcery or adultery. They believe that if a woman gets pregnant, you build the baby. And if, if you leave on a two or three month trip and you come back and your wife's tummy's bigger, then she's been committing adultery and somebody else is building the baby. And so they kill their wife. That's a terrible way to live that lifestyle. There's so much. Anyways. She said, I looked at him and I could tell. This is, I just saw her in January. She was telling us the story. She said, when I looked at him, I knew he intended to kill me. He all of a sudden, that, that day, he grabbed his bow and he shot her through the calf. Right, the arrow came right through the calf. I've seen the scars. I'm going to tell you this and I'm telling you the future. She's alive today. I've seen the scars. She shot her through the calf and then he shot her through the shoulder, deep, right into the chest. And then he took a big rock and he smashed her other knee. This knee. Smashed it. And then he took that rock and with all he had, he smashed her head and killed her. That's how they would tell the story. I don't know if he killed her or not. The scar, when I was there, she's still healing. It's almost healed, but it's this big open wound where he was just smashed the back of the rock and boom. Moy are hunters. The Moy have killed many people. They know dead people. She was dead. And so... The way they deal with a dead woman, a dead wife, they believe she had sorcery, so therefore she has to be tied to a pole, and they throw her into the rushing, mountainous, rapid, ra rap rapids that you would never raft on this river. Never. You would never survive. Roaring, rapid river. They threw her in the river, tied to a pole, dead. At least they say she was dead. 
I don't know. <laughs> Only God knows. We'll find out when we get around the throne. You can ask. All we know is that she was tie- taken for dead, tied to the pole, and thrown into the river. That was in the afternoon. All night, a long ways, underwater, um, we don't know, floating, boom, booming, banging down the rocks, down this rapid river all night long, about five in the morning, just as the sun's coming up. She said, all this, that was her first thing. She remembers the rock hitting her, and that was like her last memory. She said, in the river, the, the pole that she was tied to was hit up against a tree way down the river, and she said, all of a sudden, my first thought was, her eyes are still closed. She said, oh, creator God, you've made me alive. She opened her eyes, and she's in the river, and she's tied up, and she doesn't even remember how, but she managed to untie herself from that pole. She crawled out. Now she's got a smashed knee, an arrow through this leg, an arrow in her shoulder into the chest, and a smashed head. And so she couldn't walk, but she crawled a long ways through the jungle to a house of a person she thought would be nice to her. She got to this man's house. He looked at her, and he's like, ha, I don't know why you're alive. He took her. Remember that little nook in the bag? He had a bigger one. He put her. She was, they're smaller people, but he folded her all up, put her in the bag, hung her around his neck. That's where they carry heavy loads from the string here, and he walked three days through the jungle back to where we lived. We have a clinic there. Brought her down there three days. Can you imagine being tied up in a bag with all these wounds? Like, horrendous. Hiked down to the clinic to where we live, lived and where my sister is, and they treated her and treated her. And that was November. When I got there in January, everything was healing. She was doing fine. We actually had a jungle race. A whole bunch of women ran it. She came in, not last. The missionary, my sister, came in after her. <laughs> Second to the last. She ran through the jungle. God has healed her. She's still healing. There was not like instant healing, but she can function. She can... and. She just loved, the only thing she really, I could really hear her ever talk much about was her love for Jesus. Now, of course, her husband heard that she's alive again, and her husband sent word out, I want my wife back. And the people here, and her brother who had traded her off, who was terribly sorry he ever did that, he sent word back and says, no, you killed her. She now belongs to the creator God. You can't have her back. Your wife is dead. And this lady is a creator God's child. And she, this might surprise you, she's not real interested in marriage anymore. (laughs) She just says, I want one thing. I want my life to glorify God. That's the good news that we get to publish, that people change. Your investment in whatever form is so worth it. God is changing people all over this world because that's what he does. And that's what thrills him. And that's always been his agenda. And we still get to be a part of it. And it's not over. Someday we're going to stand around the throne and we're going to meet all these people. You're going to meet Essay Thadi. You're going to meet a lot of people that you don't even know exist that you've invested in. You've prayed for, you've given, you've encouraged, you've been engaged, you've made trips. And some of you, young people, any of you young people, raise your hand if you're 20 or less. 20 to 2. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever asked you what you're going to do when you grow up. I'll tell you what you answer them. Say, you know, I'm not totally sure, but I really want to know what God is doing, and I want to be a part of that. That's where it always starts. God, what are you doing, and how do you want me to be a part of what you're doing? Some of you will be sacrificial senders. Some will be sacrificial goers. All of us get to be involved one way or another. Those, those are the two jobs in the church, really. There's two jobs in the church. I know there's pastors and cleaners and office, and, but there's really two key jobs in the church. All of us fit into one of those two. We're senders or we're goers. And we're all a part of God's big meta-narrative of Scripture. Isn't that amazing? That the gracious God, from what he started back there, right now in 2024, we get to be a part of that picture. And it's drawing to the end. We're almost there. Give it all you got. And don't ever regret whatever it is that God has called you to do. Let's pray. Our gracious gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you gave yourself. We thank you, Father, that you didn't spare your own son. You spared Isaac, but not your own son for us. Lord, find us faithful that we would find great joy, great privilege, great honor in the fact that we get to serve you. We get to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, we do often think of those serving earthly kings and think of them as, that, that's an honor to serve the earthly king. We call it a sacrifice to serve the heavenly king. Lord, would you change our perspective and we'd think, wow, it's not a sacrifice, it's an honor to serve you in whatever our role. 
senders or goers, we're excited, Lord. Would you give us that thrill and bless this church, Lord, and bless them, Lord, for how they have given themselves. Praise your holy and wonderful and righteous name. In your precious name we pray. Amen.